There is a story I'd like to tell you. It's a story about a little boy. There he is. His name is Ziosu. And he was born in Irrawaddy Delta in Burma or Myanmar. I'll use both just to confuse you. In 2008, a massive cyclone hit the area where Ziosu was born. Tens of thousands of people were killed. At the time, Burma was one of the most isolated, most repressive countries on earth. Very difficult for journalists to get to. When the cyclone happened, journalists around the world flocked to Burmese embassies, trying to get a visa. Very few of them succeeded. And two days after the cyclone hit, I got to Burma, to Rangoon or Yangon, to the capital, with very little idea what to do. I was there to cover the cyclone for the BBC. A couple of my colleagues were staying in a hotel in the city, so I made my way to the hotel, met up with them, but we kept it very secret that we knew each other. We communicated through passing written, handwritten notes under the hotel door. Uh, and uh, two days after I got there, in front of me in a hotel lobby, my colleagues were rounded up and deported. They, the, what we needed to do is to get to the worst hit areas. So I was left alone, took me a couple of days to figure out what to do, and finally I linked up with a cameraman from Thailand who figured out a way to get to the Irrawaddy Delta. So we found a very, he found a very brave Burmese man who agreed to drive us there. And we got into the minibus um, that that man had. And the cover story was that the cameraman was a businessman from Thailand with some relatives in Burma and that he brought, and it was easier for the Thai to move around the military checkpoints and uh, that he was trying to get some aid to the worst hit areas. So we loaded up the car with bottles of water and uh, sacks of pasta, and we got into the car, and obviously it was a little harder for me to pretend that I was a Thai businessman, so for most of the journey, which lasted for 10 hours, I had to hide under the seat um, in the back of the minivan behind the bottles of water um, as we passed through this military checkpoint. It was very uncomfortable, but all complaints that I might have had disappeared the minute we got to Rubadi Delta. There were completely apocalyptic scenes, village after village destroyed, survivors huddling near the Buddhist monasteries, a chaotic rescue operation that the Burmese army was trying to launch. Tens of thousands of people dead. At night, we found a fisherman whose house was sturdier than others and was still standing, and he brought us, he took us in, and uh, Dozens of people from the village were staying in, in that house, and he's basically in the downstairs, big downstairs area. And it was there that we met Ziosu. He was 12 at the time, and he told us his story. When the cyclone hit, he managed to climb on top of a tree. And he sat on that tree for eight hours, waiting for the weather to calm. He sat there and he watched how the water took his grandmother. When he finally came down, he found out that it wasn't just his grandmother, but also his grandfather, his father, his mother, and all three of his siblings who were killed in the cyclone. He told us this story, and in the evening we sat and we made plans to get to um, that, uh, the area where Ziosu was from, and as we talked about it, how we would get there on the fisherman's boat, Ziosu said, can I come with you? And we said, sure. Next morning, I woke up at 5 a.m. We were leaving early, still in the dark, to avoid the checkpoints. And I came down, and I'll never forget that scene. Um, a big room, lots of people sleeping on the floor, and this little boy standing there with a coal iron, candlelight and a coal iron in his hand, pressing a white shirt he had borrowed from someone for the journey. We got into the boat, and we could smell it before, before we saw it, because it's a smell, even if you've never smelled it before, you know immediately, instinctively, what it is. And once the dawn broke, we saw it too, 
dozens and dozens of bodies floating on both sides of the boat, the victims of Cyclone Nargis. It took us three hours to get to the village where Ziosu was from, and for these three hours he sat there quietly staring into the distance. This is a photograph of him on that boat. And I looked at him and I really struggled to imagine what it must have been like for a 12-year-old to lose his entire family, his entire childhood, just in a matter of hours. And with, when the boat docked, this little boy jumped off the boat, stretched his hand out and helped me off. And that's it. That's all I can tell you about Ziyasu. Not because his story ends there, but because the truth is, we journalists are terrible at follow-up. And it's a problem. It's a problem because if I was able to tell you more about Ziyasu and about his community and what happened to him and his community next, I would be, the media would be, in a much better position to explain to you the next big event that happened in Myanmar. A couple of years later, Burma, this repressive, isolated regime, went through the most miraculous political transformation pretty much overnight, at least that's what it looked like from the outside. It turned from a military dictatorship into Asia's budding democracy. And I watched the coverage of this transformation and I wondered and I couldn't quite understand what was it that happened. And no one, no article that I read, no TV piece that I saw really explained it to me. So a few months late, uh, a few months ago, I happened to be seated at a, some formal dinner next to the advisor to the Burmese current Myanmar president, and I asked him the question that always bugged me. I said, "How did it happen? Like, how does a military junta wake up one day and say, okay, we're going to be good guys now?" And he laughed and he said, "Oh, it didn't happen overnight. It didn't happen like that." And then he told me something that really shocked me. He said that the single biggest reason for Burma's political transformation was Cyclone Nargis. A simple, yet missing piece of content. Something that I didn't come across in any of the narratives that was completely missing from media's narrative of Burma's transformation. It happens again and again and again in the way we cover news. Look at this country, look at Ukraine. A few months ago, many Western media organizations had reporters in Eastern Ukraine. How many are there left today? How often do you see meaningful coverage of Crimea, of what's happening in Donetsk, or even the political crisis in Kiev in the international press? We all know that stories don't happen in a vacuum. We all know that in order to understand something, anything, whether it's some big political event or you know, your neighbor's life, we need to know the context. And yet we're so bad at providing it. From Ukraine to ISIS. I mean, I remember in 2009 being in Iraq where everyone was packing up. The foreign bureaus were shutting down. As far as everyone was concerned, the war in Iraq was over. Oops. ISIS did not come out of the blue. So why is it? Why is it that we are so bad at staying on a story? I don't believe it's because journalists aren't willing to. I know plenty of committed, dedicated reporters. Some of them are among you here, and you know very well how difficult it is to sell a story to your editor once the focus and attention has moved on. But really, we can't blame the editors either. They've got a lot on their plate. There is a lot happening. And yes, of course, we all these days suffer from short attention spans. But I don't think that's it. I don't think it's a short attention span of editors or the media. I don't think it's a lack of resources. I am convinced that the real reason why we're so bad at staying on the story is because journalism, as we know it, is simply not designed for a follow-up. Think about television or a newspaper. 
You watch a television piece, a traditional television piece, and then it disappears from your screen. Or think about a newspaper piece. You read it, you read your paper, you put it in a pile. Or you don't read it, you put it in a pile, it goes in a pile. The journalism formats that we know are all disposable. We throw stuff out. And that makes it really difficult for the reporters to provide any sort of meaningful follow-up. Because I can follow the story of Zia Su for 10 months, but in order for me to follow it properly, I need to know that you have read all the previous ones. But I'm working, I'm telling you every story on an assumption that you don't have access to the stories that are now in that pile. So every time I tell you a story, I have to tell it from scratch. And that means I have to give you all the context and all the background and all the basic facts and all the little bits that you need to know. And by the time I've done all of that, I'm pretty much out of my 700 word limit or whatever, 1,000 word limit. Because I know that you're not sitting there cutting out each piece that I've written and putting it into some sort of a scrapbook that you're creating on the Burmese cyclone or Crimea. But what if we could do this for you? What if we could create that scrapbook? What if we could follow characters that are involved in crisis and in ish big issues that we cover and provide the sort of context and continuity that the real life has that is not currently reflected in the media's coverage of events? Well, guess what? We can. We can because internet changed everything except our attitude towards storytelling. What we have now is no longer a disposable platform, but a digital platform that allows stories to survive for much longer than they could ever before. The problem is that ever since this digital world entered the newsroom, the traditional newsrooms have been in a little bit of a flux. They're still trying to figure out how to do this whole online thing. Now, BBC, that's been my employer for many years, until recently, recently um, advertised for a digital diplomatic correspondent job, as opposed to an analog diplomatic correspondent. The thing is that within a few more years, there won't be such thing as digital journalism. There will be journalism, and it will be online, and I'm convinced that it will be better than anything we've had before, because it allows us to do storytelling in a completely different way. There are plenty of people who are already experimenting with various ways of storytelling. There are great new voices, um, already established voices. You'll hear from Simon Ostrovsky from Vice shortly. There is Mashable and Buzzfeed and Vox, and they're all trying different things, and they are coming with really fresh new ideas. But I think what all of us in the media business should be doing is trying to reimagine the storytelling platforms that we know. We should all be trying to think how do we engage our audiences in a different way. Whether you're an editor of a local paper in Lviv or a television station here, we all have tools now to stay on the story. And increasingly, there is evidence that that's what readers want. Because um, increasingly, the measure of success for an online story is not the number of clicks that they get, but the amount of time that people spend on a story. Readers want to engage, and we want them engaged. We want them to be engaged. But what we journalists need to do to engage them is to engage in stories in a different way ourselves. There is a lot of talk about whether journalism is as necessary as it used to be, with all the information overflow, with all the, everyone is a bit of a journalist, is a bit of a storyteller today. I personally think it's more necessary than it's ever been. Because with that information overflow, it's more necessary than ever before to filter out what's really important and to put it in context of events. There are different ways of doing it, and we came up with one. I'll show you an example. Uh, we is a coda story, if I can make this 
startup um, that brings together journalists and technologists and designers who shared initially the frustration with the inability of journalists to stay on a story. So we came up with a very simple formula. And that formula is we take one crisis at a time, one big issue at a time, we deploy with everyone else, whether it's a revolution or a financial crisis or an earthquake. But we put a team of journalists on that story and we're there for, we, we go in with a long view. We stay on it for an extended period of time, up to a year. And what we quickly realize is that in order for, to bring our audience on that journey with us, we needed a platform that moved away from that constant incremental updates. We needed to create that narrative. So we took actually Ukraine as a, uh, an example of a crisis, as a prototype for our design. And I'll just quickly walk you through it. So this is the uh, homepage that you come to where you see like the main stories that we're covering. But the key thing to this is current, that line underneath. And every time we go into a crisis, we pick several big themes that are happening, that are defining that crisis. And each piece of content, whether it's a photo story, a video, an audio or text that we publish, lives in one of these currents. So this is a story about um, a Crimean Tatar family that was attacked in, in um, Simferopol. And it lives in a violence current. And if you click on that, it shows you the context in which it sits, the wider context of other themes that are happening around it. And the overall view of the currents, you know, there's several ones that are following here, shows you the big picture of the crisis. So that we are using the design of the platform as a storytelling tool itself. The point is to cut the noise, to move away from the notion that the latest is the most important thing to the notion that what's important is the context. And I think all of us in the media business should be doing that. All of us should be thinking how to engage and how to stay on stories and subjects that we cover longer, providing a more meaningful engagement to our audience. And there are people who will say that it won't work, who will say that it doesn't matter, but I don't buy that. I don't buy it because I believe that if we journalists really do our job and tell you really good stories, you will want to come back to, ha to know what happened next. Because personally, for years I've been wondering what happened next to Ziosu. And I'm sure you too would want to know what happened next to a boy who just lost his entire family and yet stretched his hand out to help a stranger. Thank you.